so I said to him, why, why do you just always get, say you can't do the origin of Wolverine? And you know, you know what the truth is? What? The reason that they couldn't do the origin of Wolverine is because they didn't know what it was going to be. Welcome back, everyone, to the Comics Cube. Today, I am with Eisner Award winner, Prism Award winner, and five-time Wizard Fan Award winner, Paul Jenkins. Hi, Paul. How you doing? How you doing? It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, I've got several questions for you, um, and I wanted to start at the very beginning. Before you came to America, you wanted to... You wanted to be an actor, is that right? Yeah. Um, specifically, you know, I wanted to be creative. And I know that sounds kind of weird. It wasn't that I wanted to be an actor. Um, I come from a family, you know, my family is very, uh, for want of a better word, very poor and very, you know, I grew up in the countryside in a, in a little house that had no electricity for a while you know i've been homeless before <laughs> you know we were like the poorest kids i've ever seen and and i didn't know much about um the world and and but i was a kid that was going to live in a, an environment that was going to be very difficult and even to this day my my brother lives in a, in a caravan with no electricity like my family are all there and about the age of 11 I was lucky enough to win a scholarship because I was kind of a clever kid and I was going to go one of two ways. I might have gotten in a lot of trouble or I, I love sports and I love learning things. And so I went that way and I was lucky enough to go away to school. I left home when I was 11. I never went back. And I came upon the idea of, of maybe being an actor because I thought that was something that led, led me down a path that would work for me. But I really spent more time in film school. And so I trained really to be a filmmaker. And after I went through that situation, um, I, I came to America and I ran into comics and I didn't expect yeah. to either. So that's kind of how I broke in. It was the strangest, most torturous kind of thing. But I, I started to be an actor by myself. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't have anyone helping me. I never had a mentor. My father left when I was five years old. So I did all of these things by myself and I just went off to go live in the South of England to be an actor. And actually at that time I was homeless too. So I slept outside while I was trying to go through college. <laughs> it was crazy. You're, you're a, you're a self-made man moving to America for opportunity. That's the American dream. It, it is so much. And uh, what I think is so interesting about it is that I, um, I came to America with the best immigrant story. I had $50 and I was teaching music and drama to learning disabled children. I arrived with $50 and that was what I did. That's amazing. You're, you remind me of a, uh, that story reminds me of Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> yeah, it's fair enough. And you know, it's funny because when I first came here, this is a true story. Um, one of the first places I went to was Penn station in, in New York city. Right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really get a, se a sense of anything. I'm just like, yeah, it's a big city, right? It's not like I've never been to a city before, but I, I didn't really have a sense of America. And I was with a, a, a young woman at the time and you know, I was gonna go visit her family in Massachusetts and, and kind of hang out with her. And some guy comes up to me and he says, hey man, you got changed for a, a 20. And I said, yeah, I think so. Cause I'm just British. And so I, I don't get America at this point. And I, I kind of find it, I got, that's all the money I got. And I give him two fives and a 10 or something. And he gives me a one with 20 written on it. And as I'm looking at it, like, hang on a minute, he runs out the far door. The problem for this guy was that I was faster than him. So I chased him up the street and I tackled him and I got my money back. He held it up like this. And I got my, I grabbed my money and tackled him down the ground as I pushed him down. And then I walked away and I realized, hang on a minute, I've made a dollar out of this exchange. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So that was my first exposure to America. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I was in love with America this moment I got here because I just thought it was such a great, crazy place. It was my kind of place. You know, yeah. it was everything I wanted it to be. No, New York is overwhelming. Uh, I, I live in a city. The first time I was in New York, it was still like, whoa, <laughs> this is yeah, this is really big. Yeah. 
Uh, when, I, I mean, I can remember in, in Britain, we wouldn't have anything open at f four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so I remember the lights being on at three or four in the morning. And I'm like, I need to go down that, whatever that is, I need to go over there. See so what's over there. And it was crazy. Just people like trying to sell you crack and people sort of saying, hey, baby, you want a good, good time? And I'm like, I love America. This place is insane. So <laughs> that, it's kind of my first experience. And, it's just <laughs> full of energy. So you were in the right place at the right time. You're talking about how you accidentally got into comics. Uh, and then you started working for Kevin Eastman and Peter La Laird. Laird. Yeah. Is that how you say his name? Peter Laird? Laird, yeah. Yeah, Peter Laird. Um, talk about uh, accidental successes. <laughs> Those guys. Yeah. Uh, what was it like working with, uh, with quite probably the, the most the the biggest disproportion of of intent to succeed with actual success uh, with yeah, the, with that's good, isn't it? um yeah. i don't think anyone ever saw that coming it just happened you know and um you know we i suppose um one thing that you can say is i i landed in a place you know i was the second employee I, I was the third employee technically they had an office manager they had a guy doing licensing and that was me and I was 22 years old when I started. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it went crazy. You know, we, we were making the films and the toys, the merchandise, the, the TV show. And I found myself immersed in this wor world and I had, had no, I mean, I knew them because I was a musician. I came here to teach mu music and drama to learning disabled children. And um, so they did an album cover for my band, which is really funny. <laughs> and so that was funny in and of itself and and then i broke my leg playing soccer and i said uh hey guys can i come work with you because I, I i can't you know i can't wait on tables I was, you know, that's what i was doing <laughs> and they said yeah okay that sounds like a good idea we could use the help and next thing you know it's ninja turtles but here's what i would say yes that was lucky but then the question you would ask yourself is well what do you do with that luck and i've written about this quite a lot actually uh -huh. you know when you get given an opportunity it's very few people that will make that opportunity and stick that opportunity. And I'm 23 years old. I don't know what I I'm doing, but to be fair, I also didn't know what I couldn't do. And I was very, very confident about my own ability to learn. And so I just, I just stuck with it. And no matter what happened, I tried and I worked really hard. Um, and I think that sometimes when you do hard work, that can, can give you a basis for all of the things that you need to do. Right. Yeah. And so I've always been a hard worker. I've always been up later than everybody else. I've always been first there and last to leave kind of thing. And that seems to be the way of it. You know? What were your, what were your key learnings uh, creatively and business wise working for, for Mirage? Um, creatively is an interesting one. I would tell you that when I started working with them creatively, um, and actually afterwards at Tundra Publishing, right, where we went off and we published, you know, Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman and a lot mm. of Bill Sikevich. And, and I was, I had a moment, I was sitting with Alan Moore, creator of V for Vendetta, and, and I was his editor. And I was in Great Britain with him, and we were doing Big Numbers, which was the legendary unpublished book, you know? Yeah. And I started talking with Alan about storytelling, and he was explaining to me some things that he did on comic pages and I thought to myself, that's funny, that's the way I think. And I got a lot of confidence from it. If, it, if Alan Moore and I were thinking the same way, and I'm not saying I'm Alan Moore, let's be clear, okay? But if we were thinking the same way, then maybe I was onto something. And I didn't really care for the standard of a lot of stuff that I saw. So creatively, I got a lot of confidence just by being there and I realized I could do this and I should be doing this, that's what I wanted to do. Business-wise, um, you know, it was funny, I, I kind of cut my teeth on those businesses and I started as a kid and within two, you know, I'm 22 years old or so. And within two years, I was a director of the publishing company. Um, mm -hmm. I was one of four directors over there. Um, I became the editor in chief uh, right then. And then I went on to be an editor in chief at two other places. And I, I was a kid from the country that studied to be an actor, but it all comes down so there are a couple of things that I like to say to people. Confidence is exactly equal to, to, to accomplishment. Mm -hmm. If you believe that you can and you kind of not even that believe, if you know that you can, you probably can. And the second thing is that I never really thought that was much for talent, right? I don't think talent exists. I think that talent 
is potential. But if you add hard work to it and a form of like maturity, that's when you've got talent. And I, I believe that I worked very hard and the way that I grew up, I didn't have any choice but to mature at a very early age. And so I was just, but the crazy thing is that with all that money flying around, here's the kid from nowhere. I got no money. I, I didn't, I mean, you know, and yet there were so many people that were after the money and I could care less about the money. It wasn't interesting to me. I didn't want Kevin and Pete's money. It was theirs. It didn't belong to me. I never, I, I, I I worry now that I could have had some things like I could have taken toys from the toy cupboard or I could have taken all these things that were sitting in front of me, but you know, it just, I had my own ethic and they weren't mine. They didn't belong to me. So I didn't grab handfuls of toys and, and things. I just, I, I just worked there and I was very grateful to do so, you know? Yeah. You took, uh, you took your salary and that was it. Yep. That's, in, that's admirable. Um, were you in, uh, were you a fan of comics prior to stumbling upon the industry of comics? <laughs> uh, so this is a frustrating thing for a lot of fans. No, not really. Okay. Um, so how'd you stumble uh, upon it? Yeah. Uh, okay. So understand that when I said I was, I was a poor kid, I was really poor. Like yeah. we didn't have comics and I didn't have anything. I, I had seen some comics. We had one grandmother who would keep comics at her house if we would go see her. And what they were, were the reprints of the really old um, EC comics, like Uncanny Tales and Tales to Astonish and, you know, or, you know, those ones. And they were reprinted in Britain and we liked those and we could see those. And we also had these British comics. They were like very small digest comics. They were about this big and they were like called Commando and stuff like that. And they were like war comics that you could buy on a rack. And they were great and we loved those, but we, we didn't have them at home. But my grandmother, my other grandmother in London would send us a tube full of comics, maybe once every, you know, once every, every so often, you know, like every couple of months. And we would get this tube and we would open it and it would have some British comics in it. And it would have one copy of Spider-Man, which is a reprint from the original Spider-Man comics, a black and white reprint and one copy of Daredevil. So the only two characters I knew were, were Daredevil and I, I knew who Stan Lee was because he would write these big words in the back and I, I would learn to read with comics to some extent. Yeah. So I didn't know that I'd work in comics and when I came to work in them, I knew nothing about the characters. And that has always been my advantage in this job is that I come to it with a different perspective. I, I can look at the characters and say, I can tell you what we could write. And in fact, to, to illustrate that point, I don't know. You are you a big comic guy? Are you a big comic book fan? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, so give me an obscure character and tell me what their power is, and I'll illustrate the point. Uh, the <laughs> an obscure character and 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 their power. Uh, the split Zam Captain Marvel, who says split and then he splits up into multiple body parts. He splits into multiple things, right? Yeah. So, I would look at that as a storyteller. And say, so never heard of him, don't know anything about it. But you take the core of the idea, which is it's a person that splits, and you ask yourselves, who are we fundamentally, right? This is like thematically, you start looking at that and say, is that a Jekyll and Hyde type story? Are we multiple people? Is it that we all have aspects of a personality that make us whole? Are we a hundred things? Are we just two? Are we good and bad, you know? Is it a guy that can't find himself, that he's split into so many pieces that he doesn't know which one of him is real? right? And that would become a tragic kind of character. Now, that may or may not be the story I did, but you, it illustrates the point that I just tended to look at these things and say, well, why don't we try this, you know? And, and most of the time, the people at Marvel and the places I work would say, well, that's a fresh and unique take. And I'd say, yeah, that's because I don't know anything about it. It's an advantage. Yeah, it's an yeah. advantage. And it's exactly what happened to me within humans. Um, I, I had broken in with Hellblazer in the craziest way. I'd come down to, to learn. I mean, I'd, I'd gone to San Diego Comic-Con and met the editor and told him, hey, I think I could write your comic. And he asked me, what have you written? And I had to tell him I'd, I'd never written anything before. And he let me try out and I ended up getting the gig on Hellblazer. <laughs> on Hellblazer. That's uh, on Hellblazer, my, my that's, first gig. That's confidence. Like you just go up to the editor and you, say, you just say like, hey, yeah. I want to write Hellblazer. I said, will you let me try it out? And he said, I, this is so crazy. He said, go on, give it a shot. I don't know what it was. And so I tried out and they put me through my paces. And six weeks later, they said, 
congratulations, you're the new writer of Hellblazer. And I said, that's what I was aiming for. Yeah, Not to be arrogant, just that's what I tried to do. And it worked out. I had no idea what I had done, right? And I mean, do you just kind of jump right into these things and then you be like, screw it. I'll be like, if I don't get it, I don't get it. Yeah, if I don't get it, I don't get it. That's okay, but I'll give it a shot. And I, tried, a and I it was just like it was just like meeting the Ninja Turtle guys. I went up and I asked him, "Can I have a job with you?" There's nothing to lose, right? Nothing I can't believe you came up with a with like an idea for the split Zam Captain Marvel like right at the drop of a hat. That's <laughs> we could collectively That's do amazing. that. Yeah. All you do is you just thematically, thematically, you work out what it might be. Yeah, and. Mm -hmm. We could do that with anything. You could tell me any character that we'd never heard of and there could be some just wonderful ideas that come from it because that may not be the idea, but it can be an idea of something that we think is really interesting. So as long as I know what the powers are and what the frailties are, what the weaknesses are, or we can work them out ourselves, you can always write characters. And so that's what happened to me with the Inhumans. I get a phone call from Jay Lee. Mm -hmm. He says, they got this thing called Marvel Knights. Do you want to come and work on it with me? And I said, yeah. Uh, who are they? <laughs> <laughs> Get and we uh, won an Eisner. A year later, we won an Eisner. So you, you went from from Mirage to Tundra to yeah. Vertigo to Marvel Knights. So you basically oh. do have a, a tendency to go from these kind of sub imprints, right? Or like not not the yeah. main imprints of the big two. Do you enjoy that kind of creative energy? It really depends. I mean, after a while, I wrote Spider-Man and I wrote the Hulk and I wrote the origin of Wolverine. So it, it didn't yes. make any difference. I think there was a way. When I, when I took over Hellblazer, I remember hearing from a lot of people, well, you must be worried because you're following Garth Ennis. And the answer to that was, it's a comic book. Well, like, why would I be worried? I got something to say. So Garth Ennis had always written John Constantine in London. And that was his take on John Constantine. But you know, I grew up in a back end of nowhere in the countryside. And so I wrote about the world that I knew. I wrote about the, the English countryside, how mag magical it was, mm -hmm. uh, the countryside of Wales, where the rocks are and where Arthur is born and where, where the real Arthur, which is Peridur, uh, would live and, and where Albion is and where the kings of England really are from and all the people of England are from and where all the standing stones and all the countryside is. That's purely the, the magic of the British countryside. And there's Johnson Constantine walking around it, watching it get destroyed by, by the government. And so it's very anti-government, it's very typically Constantine. But we did a different thing. I almost did like magic and the country and I did different things with it. And um, so, you know, when I took over Spider-Man, I was told, well, Spider-Man's finished, it's broken. You know, they were gonna stop publishing Spider-Man actually. Um, really? And yeah, and then I took it over and I think that Mark Buckingham and I in our very first issue disproved the fact that you couldn't write Spider-Man anymore. We, we, people loved it and we became the fix-it guy. So I, I, I became the fix-it guy. It was, Paul, we need you to fix the Hulk. Okay, so I'd write the Hulk and it would start doing well and then I'd move on. And it kind of culminated in, um, in me pitching to them, well, why do you always say no to good ideas? Because they always did. They was always, you'd, you'd ask them, why, why don't you do this? And they'd say no. And you'd, you'd say, well, why? And they wouldn't be able to tell you. So I p said to them, why, why do you just always get, say you can't do the origin of Wolverine? And you know, you know what the truth is? What? The reason that they couldn't do the origin of Wolverine is because they didn't know what it was going to be. They, they had never decided what the origin would be. Yeah, we said, as, yeah, as fans, we were under the impression that they were just never going to tell it. Like they were just going to leave yeah. it a mystery forever. So how do you manage that? Well, I, I did the same stupid thing that always got me in trouble to, to, to begin with, right? For, for one thing, they loved me because I had won them an Eisner and they hadn't won one in years. <laughs> and I would kind of revived Spider-Man and things were going, you know, I mean, I'd done things. I brought the Sentry and they said, well, we don't publish new characters. And they finally gave in and did the Sentry. And he became a member of the Avengers. So that I was having success with them. And um, I said, well, you know, why, why don't you just do nothing with it? Like, why, why don't you just say like where he was born? What his real name is? Who cares? I mean, what, you're gonna keep that a secret forever? Like just say what his, what his parents are, like where's he born? And the only thing that we did that was very fanish was that we suggested the reason that he forgot, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
mostly it was that Marvel didn't know why he'd forgotten. They had no story for it. And I said, oh, I just thought it was like, you know, when he, when he cuts himself, he gets, he heals. So I figured he just went nuts or something and he, and he, and then, and then his brain, like he had PTSD and he just repaired his brain. And they said, say that again. <laughs> so <laughs> it, you know, it worked out just fine. You know, it was just the weirdest kind of moment. And I couldn't believe that they hadn't really d decided it, but we did the origin of Wolverine and it did great. Were there, were there multiple uh, versions before you decided on the actual origin of Wolverine? Like, was there like a nesting doll of Wolverine, of Wolverine origins before you figured out mm, what you were going to do? A little bit. I think what happened was that, uh, so you know I told you about how I grew up, right? Um, so if you ever read the origin of Wolverine, you can see my, it's, it's about me as a kid. There's a kid at the bottom of the hill looking up at the farmhouse with the lights blazing and he doesn't have any electricity. I mean, it was me, right? It's about me and growing up and living through those difficult times, you know, or that difficulty. Um, and so it was a story of these kids where, you know, cause I, as a kid, I could play with the farmer's children, but I wasn't allowed to their birthdays, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I know a lot about poverty and deprivation and um, that was in there. And the, the idea that he grows up in the hard life of the, the, the mines in, in British Columbia you know, all of that deprivation was stuff that I knew how to write. And so we just put that in there. But what happened was after a while, the editors realized, oh, we got a hit on our hands. So they, you know, now people would start throwing story ideas in there. And it was just like trying to manage a jigsaw puzzle at times. You know, if you ever read it, yeah, you can almost see in the origin of Wolverine, the first three issues are me and the next three issues are a bit more complicated. You know? Okay, I'll reread it under that lens. <laughs> um. And going back to the Inhumans, uh, yeah, so Jay Lee approached you for it. Uh, the Inhumans in the last four or five years have gotten a bit of a push from Marvel, both in the comics and media, and uh, it hasn't really taken off. What You wrote an Eisner Award-winning Inhuman story, probably the best Inhuman story that's ever been made. What do you think is the missing link there? Uh, you know, funnily enough, a lot of people might say they don't know. I, I can tell you exactly what I think the missing link is. And, and, I, and it, it bugs me to this day, not because of, I have any proprietary interest in the human, but just because of the, the fundamental, you know, ignoring of storytelling method and methodology, right? Um, when I started with the humans, they sent me, uh, it's kind of legendary at this point, they sent me two five page Jack Kirby stories and I read them and I said, great. That's it. I don't need any more. Please don't send me any more. And they didn't. Because you could see without getting st stuck in the Inhumans past and all the stories they might have done with the Fantastic Four, you could see that Black Bolt was the king. He was the constitutional head of state. And he couldn't speak because his voice was so resonant. Um, so if he leans out the front door and tells everyone to go away, the how you know the entire country blows up, right? And so he's just got this really resonant voice. In other words, it's a metaphor for a king who can't speak his mind because it might create a crisis. You know, we live in very fractured times right now. We we see what happens when the king s says a lot, right? You know, there's all kinds of issues now because the president of the country, for his reasons, decides he's going to say a bunch of stuff, and and you can see it like really blows people up. It, you know, the people can't agree. Um, the, the, the Karnak, uh, was a character that could see the floor in anything. You could see the, the problem. You could press a bottle and, you know, the, the edge of a glass bottle or something and it would shatter. Right. And so I wrote him as the advisor to the King who could see the flaws in inhuman society. And every part of what we did was, was like about America. It was, it was, you know, relatively straightforward. And what I learned was that there were, there were two things. And I, I told Marvel this when I wrote it. One of them was that Black Bolt had never been defeated in battle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that we would show that it, he might get close and we'd be like, this guy's going to get killed. And then he turns it on and he just takes everybody out. Right. But there was something so pure in a character that had never been defeated in battle. Yeah. And the other idea was that he's not supposed to speak. That is the tension. That's the whole point of the character. Right. And everyone before me and everyone since me writes him where he leans out the front door and he yells and stuff blows up. And I, and I kept saying, that's the whole point. That, that character cannot speak. He cannot say anything 
and you always do. So, so no one had ever liked the Inhumans. And then around about issue 10 or 11, we had fans writing in and they're like, when's he going to say something? And I said, well, now you're interested, aren't you? When we got your interest, you didn't care about these characters anymore. Now we're doing it the way. And then the very first series after I wrote the Inhumans, the very next series, he got defeated in battle for the first time. And that was the end of that because there can't be a second time. It doesn't mean anything. So now he has been defeated in battle and now you can never say that about his character. And so I, I could never work out why companies like Marvel would allow their stuff to just be destroyed like that. It's like a short-term gain or... Yeah. So I think they found this out with making Spider-Man married. Um, they didn't like it. Some people did, some people didn't. But once they had done it, it, it took an awful lot of mental gymnastics to un unring that bell. Yeah. And, you know, what I felt was, well, now he's married. So right, I'm really cool as being married. And, and they change that anyway. So it's a very strange way that they go about their business. Yeah, yeah you, uh, I mean, I, I personally prefer him unmarried, but you wrote him in such a way that I thought was, like, it, it, it worked in, uh, in, in terms of him being married. You, yeah, you, wrote, I mean, you I mean, wrote around them more than, yeah. Well, two things in that, right? So one of the things is that, sure, I wrote around them, but you know, I was getting married at the time and I was in love. I was, mm -hmm. I was getting married to my wife when I was writing Spider-Man. And so I wrote him and Mary Jane the way that we were, you know, and we were in love and we had fun together and we didn't argue and we were very honest and we communicated. And what I had seen was that the very naive views of marriage where, where he was written as an angry person, he lied and she used to complain about him all the time. <laughs> And that's not marriage, right? That's just a, a really naive view of what a marriage should be. And so it was no fun to read, but my, I think our spider marriage was fun, right? He loved Mary Jane. And I used to put all kinds of anecdotes because my, my wife is a very funny woman and she does like really goofy things. And I just used to write her in, as Mary Jane. So, you know, I think he could be married and it could be fun. But the problem was that they had made him married. They, probably shouldn't have done that in the first place once they did they should have stuck with it and committed to it you know so it just everything's gymnastics they tried so many times to get rid of it and finally they just like oh the devil did it right <laughs> uh yeah uh and you also fixed the incredible hulk uh, and that kind of reminds me earlier of the way you dissected the split zam captain marvel you just kind of took that character apart well, you know, one, one thing that I could say was that when I took over the Incredible Hulk, I think they had had a problem. And the way that they, they relate it to me, the way they explained it to me was that um, they felt that John Byrne had tried to make it John Byrne created the Incredible Hulk because he had taken it over before me. That's just their, their feelings, not really mine. I didn't know what John was doing, right? Um, but there was a moment in what John had written where the Hulk jumps up in the air and carves a, a jetliner in half and kills like 550 people. And I thought, well, he's only ever going to be a mass murderer now, right? Like, it doesn't really matter what you do with him. This doesn't seem to make, I don't know how you can get past that. Okay, you do something nice. Well, you're still going to jail for mass murder because you killed loads of people. So come on, man. So I felt like they were just jumping around and, and they didn't have the thing that I felt might work for the Hulk, which is a ticking time bomb. The Hulk should be, I'm going to, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Try, don't, you know, don't let him see you swear. And then he can't take it. And then he blows up. Right. And so we gave him Lou Gehrig's disease because he knew that he was going to mm -hmm. die. And if he died, the Hulk would take over. So we gave him a ticking time bomb and that seemed to be a pretty effective way of doing it. You, know? you just kind of get to the core of the character. So speaking of which you said that earlier um, when you were a kid, a couple of the superheroes that you actually uh, were exposed to were Spider-Man and Daredevil. And you wrote that miniseries. Uh, as a kid, I was always fascinated with the dynamics between those two. So what do you think makes yeah. that combination work? Well, they're similar people, right? They have the same kind of way of jumping around and being alive and punching people and all of that, you know, but you've got a guy, you've got one guy who is not accomplished in his private life, which is Peter Parker. He's younger and he's working it out. You've got one guy who's, you know, at the top of his game in his private life, right? And I felt that that was a really good dynamic between people because this guy might say, well, I'm going to be your mentor. And this younger guy would say, no, you're not, man. I'm doing fine. Thanks very much. You know, <laughs> like it was a great like dynamic and they weren't antagonistic to each other. 
but they would work each other's they would work their relationship out as they as they did that story it's kind of a cool way of writing it and i was very lucky because i got to write my you know the two characters that i grew up with yeah um and then at the same time you're also starting to work in video games yeah so um kind of before marvel actually i oh, really? started working on video okay. games yeah um i got into them in the mid 90s and i very quickly realized that i i felt like i had something to say there too because i did not think that the game industry felt that it was a storytelling medium and i very vehemently did i felt that games are a form of storytelling and you just have to go back to the mid 90s to hear how most people in the industry are like no they're not no they're just fighting and interactivity but you know I'm not most people and I don't surround, I don't get around most people. I get around the great people. And, and I was lucky enough to work on, after I'd done a few games, I was asked to come in and work on a game called Soul Reaver, which is a legacy of Kane uh, uh -huh. with Amy Hennig. And Amy ended up going to be the creative director at Naughty Dog. She did the Uncharted games. Um, they did, you know, The Last of Us. So, you know, she has storytelling chops and she cut those storytelling chops on, on Soul Reaver when we did that. Cause i would never, I will never forget in my career going to crystal dynamics in san jose and sitting with amy and trying to work out a story in a video game that was about gnosticism and and the ouroboros and fate and um you know the snake that eats its own tail the circle snake you know and um and that was a video game in the mid 90s right and we yeah. were doing stories about gnosticism and and existentialism right and we knew that we could but the industry kept saying, no, you can't. And no, we don't want you to and, and all of that. And yet history tells us we were right. And, yes. and the one thing you know, that really I learned from that was that when I ended up getting lucky to go to work on, uh, I did the Hulk Ultimate Destruction, um, which was fun. Like we, we turned it into fun and prototype. But when I did The Darkness, that was something that, that that game is one of the most emulated video games that you'll ever see everyone took from the darkness what we did on the darkness had never been done before and uh to it when i get to the end of my career with all the television film animation comics games whatever whatever it is that i end up doing i'll always point to the darkness and say that's probably the thing that i'm the most proud of because we changed games when we did that game yeah i was going to ask if you consider yourself a game changer in the video game industry and i guess you just answered yeah, that question um, you, you don't get to say that, right? Other people say that about you, yeah. but I have had it said, right? Um, uh -huh. To be fair. Uh, that I know that a lot of people have said that game changed everything. I know what I did for it. Um, there are things that we designed that didn't even get done in that game or the sequel that were used in Bioshock, for example. And how do I know they got used in Bioshock? Because when they showed up, my producer was the producer of Bioshock and of The Darkness. And I said, well, you cheeky bugger. You, you use that idea we had and he said yeah well you know <laughs> it was a good idea um but you know i know that what we did was was emulated all over the place and it's so crazy and this is all you need to know about the darkness video game it has these measurable statistics when you put out a game you're trying to get a 10 or a 9 or an 8.5 or whatever but ultimately you can go to something like metacritic and you can find out from metacritic how did you measure up you know and so they had measurable test results that they're like, they're like they look like this, you know, here's a, here's a 95, here's a five, right? And they would show them all the way down the line. And they took me to do the sequel to Darkness and they did the funniest thing at 2K Games. They said, uh, we're going to do something we normally don't do. We're going to tell you the truth. <laughs> they were pretty funny about it, actually. And I said, OK, I feel like I'm about to get whacked by the mob. And they said, no, we just want to show you what we learned from the first game. And so the measurable test results, you get a minus if it's negative comment, a plus if it's a positive comment, and you average it out so you kind of know where you land at. That video game scored um, 10 out of 100 in gameplay and four out of 100 in multiplayer. That's, that's terrible. That's unusable. But it scored 95% in characterization, 95% in storytelling, and 98% in cinematic experience. So you had a nothing gameplay and just this, this huge success 
it was slated to sell 350,000 copies and it sold 1.6 million copies. Oh, wow. Something. Hang on a minute. Story makes money. Yeah. And now uh, you've got, you've got exactly, you've got, you've got things like uh, the last of us and God of war. I don't play a lot of video games, but I play every Spider-Man video game. And I think you can track just the evolution of, uh, yeah. of video. So you play, you play that. the, you play the Spider-Man video games. Cause one of my best friends, Yuri Langthal in, in all the world is the voice of uh, Peter Parker in the, the PlayStation 4 one. Really? He's one of the best guys. Yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's awesome in it. Yeah. It's, it's my favorite Spider-Man non-comic adaptation. <laughs> so, yeah, it's wonderful. Like, it's, it's great. Uh, I've played it like five times. Anyway. <laughs> his, uh, wife does a lot of, his wife does the voices in it as well. Tara. Really? That's cool. Yeah. She's in it. That's awesome. Uh, speaking of Spider-Man, uh, what, one of your most frequent collaborators on Spider-Man was Humberto Ramos. And who is just generally one of your most frequent collaborators? What's it like working with with him? Yeah, so Umberto is brilliant, right? You know, he he has a style and a way that has its influences. You know, like you could look at, I mean, you know, you can go back to Bill Sienkiewicz and you can say, well, I can tell you where Bill Sienkiewicz's influences are. You know, they would be someone like Baron Story, right? But he's yeah. still Bill Sienkiewicz. He is Bill Sienkiewicz and no one else is. Dave McKean is Dave McKean, but you can still see some of his, you know, Kent Williams is Kent Williams, right? Umberto Ramos is Umberto Ramos, but you can see where some of his influences are, but then you can see how many people he influences. So working with Umberto, what is so funny is that we did Spider-Man together and we had fun and we did well. And one of the first times that we broke away from Marvel together, we did not do the fairy quest book that I know people know right now. Yeah. Uh, we did a book called Revelations that was a murder mystery that was set in the Vatican. It was a six issue murder mystery. And the reason that book is so cool is because when you come out every month, you know, you got month number one and month number two, and people start speculating online and they would say, well, I know how this ends. I know what this is going to be. I know what the twist is. And you get to issue five and nobody but nobody had guessed what the ending of that story was. And then they read the last issue and everybody went, oh, wow, I did. I'll be honest, I didn't see that. There wasn't one single guess that was even close about what was going on. So we really felt that that was successful and the colors were beautiful and, and, and the artwork was so unique. And so he and I went on to do Fairy Quest together. Um, and, and again, you know, it, it's just such a unique and wonderful kind of book, you know? You're now on the third book of Fairy Quest that's got an Indiegogo. Yeah, yeah. We, we had done a, um, we'd done a Kickstarter. That's generally our core audience. You know, we have always been on Kickstarter, but we wanted to do, move it to Indiegogo because there's a couple of things that I learned. You know, we, we've never, we had never done Indiegogo before and I had been told, hey, listen, there's a bunch of people that have never, you know, there's a bunch of people that never go to Kickstarter. And I'm like, well, I want them to read my book, you know? Uh, so we just put it up on, on Indiegogo as like a supplemental to what we had done. And we can leave it up there for good. We're going to keep it up there. So that it goes on a thing called In Demand. You can't really do that on, 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 on Kickstarter, but you can on Indiegogo. Really? So we just leave it up there for a few months. And then when we, go, when we get to the very end of it, you know, people will have, will have bought into the book. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to send everybody else that book as well, you know? Can you, can you, for, for the benefit of our viewers, can you give us an elevator pitch about Fairy Quest? Yes, yeah, so Fairy Quest is set in the world of Fablewood, and it's a world where all of the stories that have ever been told live in one giant forest. So you've got like, you know, children's stories right in the middle, but you've got, you know, horror stories and crime stories and romantic fiction and stuff like that all around in this world. And every part of the forest that's never been discovered is the stories that have not been told yet. Um, so right in the middle, the children's stories live. And in, in Fairy Quest, uh, they live in a place where they're run by in a very fascist kind of society. Um, they are made to tell their story. And if they don't tell their story properly, they get their minds wiped in the dreaded mind eraser. So it's like a lot of children's stories. It's just a little bit macabre. And the way that we had set it up, basically, is that um, Red Riding Hood and the Wolf unbeknownst to everybody are our best friends and they do not want to tell their story anymore. So they decide to escape to freedom um, along the yellow brick road uh, in the opposite direction. And they find a place called the real world that, that a girl called Wendy came from. They want to go there. Mm -hmm. And as they go, they begin to see the size of the world. You know, so a lot of this is about friendship and tolerance and 
being united in a fractured society, um, which I think is very relevant because uh, again, you know, I don't really do politics at all, but you can tell that we're in a really difficult moment right now. Um, and so it is about like, how do we stay together? How do we stay friends? How do we, how do we remain true to who we really are when everything's kind of crumbling around us? Um, but for a little kid, it's red riding on the wall for best friends and they're trying to get away from the bad guys. No? You think stories are just inherently a commentary on what's going on in the world? Like, you can't help I don't it. Think or... you know. Yeah, I don't think you ever know. I think you find out afterwards when you start. To, you don't often, sometimes you don't intend to start out that way, but you find out that's what it is. I often find that stories that I've written are a commentary on the way that I was at the time. And I didn't realize it until afterwards, you know. Um, good example, you know, when I was writing Spider-Man, I realized that my entire run on Spider-Man, especially the stuff I did with Bucky, um, these single issue stories I wrote, everything was about me. Every story is about me. And it's funny, you know, now on my YouTube channel, um, on Meta Studios, we are doing a weekly thing. It's called the story behind the story. And every single book that I've ever written has a story behind it. Um, one that occurs to me, for example, is, uh, you know, when I was playing, I was a lifetime soccer player. And um, in 1997, I was playing and someone came up behind me and, and broke my neck. Wow. And I was really, really ill. Um, I lost 50 pounds. I lay in a bathtub. I, did, I couldn't lift my head up. And if I did, I'd pass out. And I thought that might be the rest of my life. I was absolutely devastated by this injury. It, it changed me. And so I wrote a story in Spider-Man, two issues about a character called Fusion that persuades him through persuasion that he's broken his neck. And he thinks he's broken his neck. And he's laying there, he's just completely out. And that was a dark moment in my life. And, and yeah, you know, I got to write it in, in this book. And so I think that you write about yourself for your audience. And that, that's all I've ever done. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, getting back to fairy quest, what do you think it is the appeal of uh, mashing together uh, fairy tales and various stories? So it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> that's something yeah. we've seen quite um, a bit in the last couple of, couple of decades, but it's, all, it's always fresh and it's always yeah. well received. Yeah, I can't speak for anybody else's. I can speak for ours. I know how honest that book is because really at the core of it is just the two characters that love each other very much and they're trying. He's a grumpy old curmudgeon of a wolf but he has a very sad background because he's made to tell a story with the very same hunters who killed his vixen and his calves, his wife and children. Mm -hmm. And so she hates the tragedy. She loves him. She hates the tragedy of his life that every day he has to repeat the story with the people who murdered his family. And so, you know, she has this pity for him and we love him for this, right? Cause he always protects her always. He looks after her and he's always got her back. And so he's there for her, even though he's just a wolf, you know, and she calls him Mr. Wolf. And so it's just this really sweet relationship between the two of them. And as they get further away from their story and as they get closer to the real world, actually, you'll see it in the art now. The art is changing because mm -hmm. they are starting to become real. And so they're beginning to look different as they get closer and further away from, from the center of their story. Realistically drawn by, by Humberto, that's a... Uh... That's interesting. Well, Umberto is now, Umberto is now the cover artist. You know, he went on to do other things. Uh, we have a, to do the transitional kind of moment in the story. Now we're on with uh, Mike, Mike Bowden. And so oh, Mike okay. Bowden is a great artist. Yeah, he's incredible. And so he's now taking over the bit where they begin to change and they go through, uh, right now they're going through Wonderland. So Mike will kind of take it to the end in his style because they're not cartoons anymore. They're not in children's land anymore. They're beginning to get closer to the world of crime and the world of, of science fiction. And at that point, they're going to be a, more of a real girl and a real wolf. So it's a really cool transitional story, you know? How much does your approach to story change based on the artist that you're, that you're working with? So for example, Mike Bowden, Humberto, and uh, like Jay Lee. Like, this yeah, it changes. And that's, um, I'm apparently relatively unique in that regard because I'm the writer that calls up the artist and says, what do you want to draw? Mm. And it's a collaborative medium. I can't imagine why every writer wouldn't want to do that with an artist. It's the two people telling the story, the writer and the artist. So it shouldn't be that the writer dictates to the artist. It should be that the artist and the writer are collaborating on some ideas and, and doing it together. I think of me as the writer and co-director of a movie and think of the artist as the director of photography and the co-director of the movie. And we work together to tell a story. So I, I, I change and I do adapt to each of the artists that I work with. 
And uh, what do you prefer? Like, do you prefer writing or editing? Oh, writing, I think, but um, I really prefer directing, to be honest, and game design. No, I, I, writing, I, I, you know, I didn't train to be a writer. I became one because uh -huh. uh, I was too stupid not to. <laughs> but um, I like designing new projects. I really like telling stories in new media in ways that they've never been told before. So I've, I've actually got two projects I'm working on that I'm doing that with right now. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah, I can't, I can't really. I mean, one of them is a, a digital interactive story that we're doing over a company in Canada that's got a new form of storytelling where it is not a digital comic. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we might think of it that way. But the problem with motion comics is that they just, you know, the characters there and then there's a bit of an arm movement and some corn waves in the background. That's nothing, right? That's not, that's not a storytelling method. It doesn't add anything. We are using digital assets to help tell a story. Um, sound, haptic feedback on a phone, you know, things like that. Like we're going to, I mean, if you are reading or playing and your phone has haptic feedback, it, it bangs or something like that. Um, you know, you are going to, you are going to, to do well um, because you understand that you can. So I'm actually going to tell you how haptic feedback has worked in the story for me, right? This is a funny story. When I was working on Darkness 2, I had been pitching to game designers for years. Why, when we play first person video games, don't we use haptic feedback in the controller so that when our character speaks, we get a little bit of a buzz that approximates the voice box of, or the vocal resonance of the first person character. We can't see ourselves, but we'll know we're speaking because we give a just a little bit of haptic feedback when we speak. And I got resistance from that and I just felt it was a great storytelling method. And then finally we did it in darkness too. And I remember the very first day they, they, uh, they did an, uh, uh, opening of the game on IGN. And as they were playing it, the IGN person says, wow, every time I speak, the controller rumbles, whose idea was that? That's the most incredible thing. And they looked at each other and they said, yeah, that was Paul Jenkins. <laughs> Because I'm a closet designer, right? Like that's yeah. the thing. So it's um, you know, it's quite interesting. That's awesome. Uh, so you're uh, you continually push for new ideas. So actually, here's what here's one of my last questions. Uh, if we're gonna go back to something like 1988, if one of the greatest comic book writers came up to you, and one of the greatest comic book artists came up to you and said we want to do a square comic book about shopping malls and math. Yeah. Would, would you have said yes back then as well? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What was that whole a story, experience? A story I suspect that you're talking about, about fractal mathematics and the, you know, the, the butterfly effect and yeah. the interconnectedness of all things and, and our existence. Yeah. That's big numbers. And, yeah. and I was the series editor. Um, and I was a kid and it gave me a bleeding stomach also because it was so complicated. <laughs> it was a strange moment in my life. It was a very strange moment in comic book history, but you know, it paid off in the end in a weird way because I own half of the unpublished big numbers. Number three. We, I heard you were auctioning off one of the pages. I, I auctioned it off. Um, because as you know, the country has been in upheaval and, um, uh, Gail Simone had, had, um, you know, she had, she had put forward something that I thought meant something great, you know, that, that the world needs us to kind of step up. And I am a person from, so I, I, I might be one of the most contradictory types of person, right? Because I, you know, I'm, I'm white privilege on steroids, right? I'm, I've got British accent living in America. You couldn't, you can't fail with a British accent. I'm the guy that when I get pulled over by the police, I'm thinking I can probably get out this ticket. All I have to do is say, hello officer, how are you? Like James Bond and I'm out. And that is not the experience of many people in this country and in the world. And, and yet, man, I, I know how it feels to be victimized. I grew up with a bunch of gypsies, you know? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I know how it is not to eat. And so I have a lot 
of understanding about the difficulty that people might face. And yet I have an incredible privilege. And so when that came about, I thought Gail's idea was incredibly wonderful. And, and so we gave a page uh, that was auctioned off for Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and it raised $5,000, which is great. That's amazing, $5,000. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. So that's, that ends up, like, it's a big what if in comic book history, that whole series. Yeah. You, you ever wish, you, you, uh, you ever wish you, you guys finished it? Yes, uh, Alan doesn't. I <laughs> talked to him afterwards and I said, man, I, I would, I would love to, to know if we could ever do it. And he said, it's gone. So do you know the story of Samuel Taylor Coleridge writing his magnus, magnum opus Kubla Khan? Have you ever heard of this? No, I haven't. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the British poet, uh, wrote yeah. about this in Hellblazer, by the way. Um, he was stoned out of his mind on opiates and he was sitting down to write and he suddenly had this poem, Kubla Khan. In Xanadu de Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, he starts writing and he writes a stream of consciousness that is his greatest work. And as he's writing, a local tax collector from the local town of Porlock came and started knocking on his door and wouldn't leave him alone. And he's saying, go away, I'm writing. And the guy wouldn't leave him alone. So eventually he goes to the door and he talks to the guy and he comes back and he, he can't do it anymore. It's gone. Right. Mm -hmm. And we lost that. But to some extent we have it. And so we lost what Alan was going to write and what Bill was going to do and anyone else who was going to finish it. But, um, what we have is great. Yeah. I will tell you this. It has been my privilege to see the entire breakdown. I've seen the breakdown. Mm -hmm. The uh, um, this big square the that big Alan square. showed me. I sat there and went over it with him about what happened to every character and how it was connected because it was all about the interconnectedness of all things. Yeah. Um, and my very last question, because I've noticed this with almost everyone I'm asking, uh, and I keep on forgetting to ask this. It's just... Do you think uh, crowdfunding has changed the game for comics? Yes, thank God. For the better? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's great. I think I've been an advocate for creators <clears throat> in every moment of my career throughout, you know, the last 32 years or so. Um, I was lucky enough to work with two creators that owned their copy content in the Ninja Turtles. Uh, we made a company in, in, in Tundra that would give the creators their ownership. We paved the way for image. You know, yeah. I, I really think that we were the guiding light and I, I care very much about creators and them having the right to do what they do because they created it. And yet, you know, I, I went into the corporations and I've been into big corporations for video games you know, did you see my? Did you see me in the credits for the Origin of Wolverine, or, yeah, or the of Hulk dogs that I created, or the Hulk dogs that I created, or um, the first Spider-Man movie that was based on the Re Return of the Goblin? Did you see me in the credits for you know? I don't. I don't. You know, pick, pick them right because because yeah. that's corporations that own creators. I'm not into that, and so I think that crowdfunding and crowdsourcing of ideas and that is the way it should always have been. And that's really where I concentrate my time right now. Yeah. I saw you left, uh, you left, I remember you left uh, the big two like around eight years ago. You never looked back. No, no, it yeah. was, uh, if you think about what I did for Marvel and how much we rebuilt and what they get out of it and what I get out of it, they get 100% and they always do. They got it out of Jack Kirby. They got it out of everybody. They always do. Mm -hmm. and, you know, no thanks. It's not to say I want, actually occasionally I go back and do DC. I'm doing a DC project right now. A little one. I do yeah. it sometimes, but it's okay. It just keeps my name out there and it's, it's okay. I can have a cordial relationship with, with DC. Um, but you know, it's not my thing anymore. I've got other things to do. All right. Uh, do you have anything else you want to plug? Um, no, not really. I don't, because I'm not really good at plugging, but I will say maybe that, you know, people might like to come to our YouTube channel, um, yeah. Meta Studios at ATL, Meta Studios Atlanta. Um, 
follow me on Twitter at Mike Paul Jenkins and come, come see us at Indiegogo. Come, come find our ferry quest at Indiegogo. Yeah. So for the benefit of everyone, uh, I'm going to put your YouTube channel up here and the suggested videos and your Indiegogo down here in the, in the description. All right. Come and learn about the story behind the story. It's really fun. Thank you so much, Mr. Paul Jenkins. This was an awesome talk. Thank you very much. Awesome.